No battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. That's one of Murphy's laws of combat, and it's been true throughout history. Grunts weren't the only ones to make this quip. Plenty of generals throughout history came to the conclusion that battle plans are always subject to such changing circumstances that they are often torn to pieces very soon after combat is engaged. One of those generals was the famous Prussian field marshal, Helmut von Moltke the Elder, who in his 1871 work On Strategy wrote, Therefore, no plan of operations extends with any certainty beyond the first contact with the main hostile force. Not as catchy as Murphy, but it gets the point across. This doesn't mean, of course, that von Moltke never engaged in any planning. He was just aware that the tactical disposition following first contact would be his starting point for planning his next operation, and he couldn't know the tactical disposition until the operation was already carried out. That's self-evident for tactical engagements, but even larger strategic plans can be torn to pieces at the first touch of combat. One war was infamous for destroying all the plans going into it within the first month shattering the preconceptions of the nations involved and leaving generals stunned and confused, clawing their way toward daylight and sanity. It was the Great War, and it was great in the biblical sense of the word great. Great for its size, great for its scope, and great for the way it transformed the entire world. This gigantic war had its first battle in tiny Belgium, but it would grow and engulf the entire world. This is the Battle of Liege. The lead-up to World War I is much talked about, but the German invasion of Belgium was one of the most pivotal moments of the frantic weeks leading up to the Great War. Germany knew that it was going to be surrounded by two strong land powers, the Third French Republic and the Empire of Russia. Both had had a strong alliance since 1894. Russia at the time was often thought to be an outdated backwater, but Tsar Nicholas II had other planned. He embarked on a series of modernization reforms, especially in the area of railroads, using money loaned to them by France. French President Poincaré and Nicholas II met frequently and had a good relationship, and that meant in any war, Germany would fight on the west and on the east. Russia and France together could put forth many more men than Germany could, So the General Army Command had devised a stratagem to decisively defeat one of their two enemies quickly, knocking them out and then moving to face the other before the manpower advantage simply became so overwhelming that it didn't matter what stratagem Germany employed. This plan was named the Schlieffen Plan, after its developer, Count Alfred von Schlieffen. Schlieffen was the German Army's chief of staff from 1901 to 1906, and before that had been an army commander in the Austro-Prussian War of 1866 and the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Schlieffen had recognized that France had a strong defensive line on its border with Germany and had a natural second defensive line in the areas of Verdun, Paris, and the Marne River. So to counter this strong bulwark, Schlieffen devised a plan to cross the Seine to the west of Paris, striking the second fortress zone from the west where the defenses were lighter. This would collapse the left flank and threaten the French capital of Paris with a massive German army and force a capitulation lest France lose their capital. A quick resolution using aggressive movement would crush France in a relatively short period of time in a rehash of the 1870 Franco-Prussian War. In the era before large-scale air travel and when the automobile was still a relatively novel concept, the train was the backbone of military logistics and preparing for war required massive timetables and organization. The reliance on the train and these timetables meant that plans were very static things. At one point, when the German Kaiser offered to change the plan, Moltke was quoted to have said, Your Majesty, you do not improvise the movement of millions. Winning meant taking to heart the words of Nathan Bedford Forrest, to get there first with the most men. Now, the most men is an important consideration because the armies of World War I were much larger than the armies of ages past. Germany had 4.5 million active and reserve duty at the outset of World War I. France itself had 4 million. Russia was just a little shy of 6 million. The last large war 
the Russo-Japanese War just 10 years previously, even at its height, the Russians had about 650,000 men active at one time, and the Japanese had about 700,000 for every single active theater. To give a sense how the size of armies had changed from just 10 years, the German invasion of Belgium, which is a flanking maneuver, had 750,000 men. The size of modern armies had drastically changed, but the generals were still using the techniques that they had developed from earlier, back in the 1800s, before any of the new technologies that currently existed had been employed. This would come back to haunt them, and it wouldn't take long to do that. Schlieffen's plans had problems. One of the major ones is that this flanking maneuver had to march through territory that was neither German nor French, but territory in Belgium and the Netherlands, and that meant invading a neutral country. Schlieffen had specifically designed this plan for a war between France and Germany only, without Russian involvement, but Russia and France had been allied for ten years when Schlieffen designed this plan, so not including Russia is either a curious omission or that Schlieffen had intended what the new Army General Chief of Staff, Helmut von Moltke the Younger, was planning, to knock out France and then go and face the Russians. No one could ask Schlieffen because he left military service in 1906 after suffering an injury from a horse, and he only ever had to commit his plan to paper, Helmut von Moltke the Younger, who is the nephew to the famous Elder von Moltke, was the one who had to put it into practice. The German leadership liked von Schlieffen's plan, but Moltke was in charge of any defense in the Eastern Theater against the Russians. Berlin was a lot closer to Russia than France. Russia had many more men than France, and Eastern Germany was Prussia, home to a lot of the German aristocracy, including the military, and that meant the defense of the Eastern Front had important military and political implications. For that, von Moltke modified the Schlieffen plan, sending 180,000 men to the east to stave off any preliminary Russian incursion and removing the push to the Netherlands and focusing on Belgium and Luxembourg only. There was no way around Belgium in the Schlieffen plan, and that meant Belgium, like it or not, was going to be drawn into the war. Tiny Belgium, much smaller than France or Germany, didn't want to be involved in the war at all, and on the 22nd of July, 1914, with the appearance of war between Germany and France imminent, Belgium sent a message to both countries saying that it would uphold its neutrality, that it didn't want nor intend to be involved in any dispute with France and Germany, and to enter its territory was to violate that neutrality. Violating Belgian neutrality was a very serious matter, because Belgium's neutrality was guaranteed by the British and the British were probably the most powerful of the great powers in Europe before World War I, and probably the most powerful great power in the entire world. London was the center of world finance and trade, and Great Britain had the most powerful navy in the world, a navy that could blockade German shipping in less than a week, if need be. Great Britain had guaranteed the neutrality of Belgium since 1839, and it was a vital strategic interest for England. The valuable port city of Antwerp was in Belgium, and keeping it out of its rival's hands preserved the balance of power. For most of its existence of an independent Belgium, Great Britain had always feared that France would attempt to annex the country. But with the rise of the new and powerful Germany, Great Britain now had another power to contend with in the increasingly complex web that was European politics. Von Moltke had told the Belgians that he didn't mean them any harm, he just wanted to pass through their country, and if they turned over the keys to their border forts, he would march right through. Anything damaged would be paid for fairly, no Belgian soldiers or civilians would be harmed, no territory would be annexed. All they wanted to do was march through Belgium to hit France, to use the Belgian roads and railways for their attack, and then they would march back after the war was won to face the Russians, still friendly with the Belgian government and the Belgian people. This was the second time in the build-up to World War I that a small nation was asked to surrender sovereignty by a large nation. In the July crisis, Austria-Hungary asked for police powers in Serbia for the investigation into the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The Serbians refused that demand, and the Belgians did the exact same thing with the Germans. As soon as the Germans crossed into Belgium, the Belgians destroyed their bridges and railways 
and began to shoot at the Germans. The Deutsch here anticipated a little bit of fire, expecting the Belgians to shoot a few times in the air to preserve their honor and then stand aside. After all, the size of the German army coming through completely dwarfed the puny Belgian army, but the sight of the demolished bridges let it be known, Belgium was going to fight. To von Moltke's credit, he did have a plan for what to do in case the Belgians did not elect to allow the Germans to march through. He sent an advanced force of about 30,000 men, led by Otto von Emich, in case he had to fight, and the rest of the army would continue the fight as they arrived. Their orders were to continue the march of the Germans, because the Schlieffen plan depended on the quick defeat of France that the Germans could attack the Russians on a single front war. The German army needed to neutralize the Belgian defenses, which consisted of a ring of fort, the construction of which was supervised by a native of Liege, General Gerard Le Mans. During the construction of these forts, he was apparently told by a Belgian minister that the forts were a dangerous provocation, liable to compromise Belgium's neutrality towards Germany and France. Le Mans apparently scoffed at the idea and continued to build these forts were established in 1888 using the latest in building technology at the time, concrete, and built to withstand the highest caliber artillery known, at that time, the 21-centimeter shell. These forts included underground positions and sunken turrets which could raise out of the earth and fire. They were also equipped with great artillery pieces with overlapping fields of fire and linked by telegraph and phone lines, but not underground tunnels so that any approaching army would face a withering barrage of fire on their approach. However, the construction of these forts had a key flaw. They could only set the concrete during the day, as opposed to building continuously, and this set the concrete and the heating and cooling due to the temperature variance during the day and during the night meant that the concrete set in ways that were less structurally sound and they weren't using reinforcing steel beams, which was common practice for concrete structures in later eras. The telegraph and phone lines also were above ground, which meant that they were vulnerable to enemy fire, as opposed to below ground telegraph and phone lines, which were considered much safer and much more reliable. These forts were not meant to hold off an advancing army forever. They were predicted to last approximately one month, enough time for Belgium and its allies to mobilize their forces and engage the enemy in battle. The Germans launched their attack on the 5th of August, 1914. The terrain of Liege was a snake pit of ravines and ridges, and the flatter lands were taken up by houses, hedges, and fences, making the area very difficult to maneuver, and that was even before the Belgians destroyed their bridges and railways. Combat in this sort of tight, enclosed terrain is very difficult and nerve-wracking. There are a lot of blind corners in such terrain. That's one of the biggest difficulties in urban combat, this element of surprise. These Germans had been marching since the beginning of August. Many of them were tired. Most of them had not ever experienced combat before, and these men were about to be thrown into very difficult, tight combat. As soon as the Germans advanced to the town of Liege, they came under heavy machine gun fire from the Belgian army. The German commanders ordered mass infantry attacks, which was the doctrine of the time for every army, in an attempt to overrun the Belgian positions, force a retreat, and then deploy the cavalry for the pursuit. The problem is, as we've said, the equipment of the time is chained. Beforehand, an army would use a window of advance while enemy volleys are cycling and reloading between shots, basically, moving at the double in bursts but machine guns were plentiful enough and accurate enough that this was no longer an effective infantry tactic. Massed men became masses of dead and wounded, and machine gun fire just cut them to ribbons. Sustained machine gun fire was very effective at repulsing wave attacks. One Belgian civilian observing the battle, Paul Hemelis, remarked on the power of the machine gun when it came to attacking the German columns on the march. The German storming parties marched up in thick lines, as steadily as if on parade in the cold moonlight. The Belgian onlookers began to be anxious lest the enemy should be allowed to come too near, when a single long report of mitrailleuses, all firing together, sent them to the other world in a single puff. This repeated time after time. Paul 
would later recall stacks of German bodies six or seven deep, dead and wounded together in a mass pile. There were so many corpses that the bodies had to be piled together, covered in quicklime, and then have water poured on them in order to melt them. No one had anticipated this. The fighting around Liege would last for a solid two days, with many German casualties. The Germans made some key advances, but several units were isolated during the complex movements and killed or captured, or just getting lost in the night. Pushes to the north and south, which included one Zeppelin, failed, and other Porsches had been successful only in pushing them to the defensive works that were supported by the ring of fortresses. During the dawn of the 7th of August, the German field guns started their advance and had a much stronger effect on the Belgian positions. One soldier, finding that the general had been killed, not Otto von Emmerich, just a corps commander, rallied who he could and advanced them to the northwestern gates of Liege, and then marched ahead, completely alone. If the records are to be believed, he pounded on the door of the citadel with his sword and demanded a surrender, and this was a major gamble, but it was one that paid off. The citadel surrendered, and this general became the toast of the Kaiserreich. This general will be the future quartermaster general of the entire German army in 1916, the de facto leader of all of its armed forces. But his World War I career would start right here. Erich Ludendorff. After the city fell on the 7th of August, von Emmich and Ludendorff turned to take the forts, which was commanded by General Lehmann, the very general that had supervised the building. Speed was essential, so almost immediately on the 8th of August, frontal assaults were ordered against the forts. Just like the first wave attacks against the city of Liege, these attacks were disasters, with many Germans dying to machine gun fire and artillery. The attacks were a mass of confusion, with several units pulling back after receiving false reports the Belgians were counterattacking out of Namur, another ring of forts which was meant to protect against French incursion. This chaos is quite normal on a battlefield, especially in an era before the modern interconnected one that we have right now. The availability of information today makes the early 20th century seem almost alien to us. From the 8th of August to the 11th of August, infantry and light field artillery attacks failed to make much impression on the forts, delaying the implementation of the Schlieffen Plan and causing the Germans many casualties. The Germans tried to flank the forts to attack their vulnerable rear, as the forts had been designed to be easily retaken by a Belgian counterattack should one fall the enemy. These attacks had more progress, but the forts still defiantly held out. On the 12th of August, though, the Germans received a game-changing new weapon. One of their newest and most powerful had finally entered the field. In 1815, Napoleon was considered an artillery master and proved the power of his cannons. The signature cannon of that era was named after him and was called the Napoleon fired a 12-pound projectile, and the cannon itself weighed about 1,800 pounds, and was one of the heaviest field pieces of the area. Artillery, of course, increases in destructive power as technology improved, but the siege guns that the Germans brought to this battle were something else entirely. The cannons of Napoleon were about 1,800 pounds, but this new German weapon would be firing shells about that size. The cannon itself was so heavy that a 200-man German artillery crew had to lay concrete before they could assemble them. This cannon could not be moved once assembled. The parts had to be shipped on rail cars and then pulled by oxen to the front. It was one of the newest artillery pieces fielded in the early stages of the war, the Type M Kurs Marine Cannon, but it had a more famous name, Big Bertha. Big Bertha's power was so great that artillery crews had to fire it from almost a hundred meters away, lying prone, their noses and ears stuffed with cotton, their mouths open so they didn't blow out their eardrums. When Bertha fired a projectile, it took a full minute for it to land, and it came in almost purely vertically. The ring of Belgian forts were built to withstand 21-centimeter guns. Big Bertha fired a 42-centimeter shell. And artillery math is not like normal math. A shell twice as big is not twice its power. It's much more powerful, with much more explosives. These forts could not withstand shells of that size. The bombardment also made another problem apparent, that of ventilation. 
It almost seems like a minor thing to think about ventilation when cannons as heavy as houses are firing shells that can pulverize a man simply by the concussive force alone, but it's a serious concern during a siege situation. The artillery shells released noxious fumes when they exploded. This isn't poisonous gas that would be used later in World War I, but it does cause damage to the respiratory tract. The machine guns and artillery bombardment cut off evacuation routes to the infirmary. That meant that the smell of blood and feces couldn't be ventilated. This stench is overpowering even in a short duration, but these Belgian soldiers were trapped, breathing in all of that poisonous, rotting air. General Lehman himself wrote about the experience of being bombarded by Big Bertha. Nobody will ever be able to form any adequate idea of what the reality was like. I have only learned since that when the big siege mortars entered into action, they hurled against us shells weighing 1,000 kilos, the explosive force of which surpasses anything known hitherto. Their approach was to be heard in an acute buzzing, and they burst with a thunderous roar, raising clouds of missiles, stones, and dust. So put yourself in the shoes of the Belgian soldiers in those forts. You've done such tremendous damage against the Germans with your machine guns, but they keep coming, and then they build this gigantic siege gun, and it fires. An agonizing sixty seconds of shrill buzzing as the shell screams home, and then a giant plume of earth and stone flies up in front of the fort, almost as tall as it is. Then the next shot is fired, and it's a little closer. Then the next one is fired, and it's even closer. The Germans are dialing in the distance to land an accurate shot, and your guns don't have the range to provide effective counter-battery fire. There is nothing you can do about this gigantic gun. Your fort was built to handle the artillery of twenty years ago. Those were pea-shooters compared to this thing. Then finally, the first shell hits the fortress and the concrete is reduced to pebbles, and it falls all around you, and ugly red smears dot the fortress of where your friends were. The choking chemicals of explosives and offal fill the air, making it difficult to breathe, difficult to see, difficult to concentrate. How long does it take before your position is the next one hit by this gigantic cannon? What are you going to do when that happens? Is it even possible that you won't know what you're going to do until you're actually there? This bombardment could last five hours, five hours seeing the concrete ruined by these gigantic shells and knowing your defenses are completely insufficient. Can you hold out until you surrender? How are you going to surrender? Would a machine gunner just see your uniform and fire first and ask questions never? And that's if you're lucky. Fort Lawson had their ammunition magazines explode. That almost completely leveled the fort and killed many of the defenders. These Belgians were bombarded for hours over the course of a few days, and the forts were taken by the power of the German army. On the 16th of August, the final fort surrendered after a short bombardment, and General Gerard Limon was captured. He would be a prisoner of the German army until 1917, when he was transferred to Switzerland due to poor health. A German officer wrote at length about the capture of Lehmann, summing up that General Lehmann's defense of Liege combined all that is noble all that is tragic. He was present when General Lehman was found pinned under debris, unconscious from the fumes, and you can see the old world sensibilities that were on full display. With gentleness and care which showed they respected the man who had resisted them so valiantly and stubbornly, our infantry released the general's wounded form and carried him away. We thought him dead, but he recovered consciousness and looking around said, It is as it is. The men fought valiantly and then, turning to us, added, Put in your dispatches that I was unconscious. We brought him to our commander, General von Emick, and the two generals saluted. We tried to speak words of comfort, but he was silent. He is known as the silent general. I was unconscious. Be sure and put that in your dispatches. More than that, he would not say. Extending his hand, our commander said, General, you have gallantly and nobly held your forts. General Lehman replied, I thank you. Our troops have lived up to their reputations. With a smile, he added, War is not like maneuvers, a reference to the fact that General von Emick was recently with General Lehman during the Belgian maneuvers. Then, unbuckling his sword, General Lehman tended it to General von Emick. No, replied the German commander with a bow, keep your sword. To have crossed swords with you has been an honor. And the fire in General Lehman's eye was dimmed by a tear. 
The forts were designed to hold out a month while the Belgians and Allies mobilized. They lasted eight days. Those eight days, however, were enough for a partial mobilization, and the Belgians and French would continue the land war, along with reinforcements from the small but professional British Expeditionary Force. The casualties were beyond what anyone was predicting. The Germans lost 3,300 men just on the attack in the city, the lesser defended target. The Germans would continue the march into France, swing by the northwest, and threaten Paris just as their plan had hoped. But the time lost fighting in Belgium and the war of movement that would be launched that would delay it even further would cripple the Schlieffen plan, and ultimately it would meet its end at the First Battle of the Marne, a battle the French dubbed the Miracle of the Marne, and it completely ruined the German war strategy. Even more than that, though, the outdated tactics and technologies at Liege would not hold up to the enemy. Forts crumbled under the barrage of new artillery. Human waves could not overrun machine gun nests without significant cost. Military officers needed to come up with new technologies and new tactics to handle the awesome capability of new weapons fielded by modern warfare. These outdated tactics, in the span of one month, just on the Western Front, made one-sixth of the German army into casualties, over one-fifth of the French army, one-half of the British Expeditionary Force. These losses were unsustainable, even by the modernized nation-states of the 1910s. General Eisenhower said, In preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. And he's right. The massive logistics operations to enable the German army to invade Belgium required planning, but the Schlieffen plan fell to pieces at the hand of the Belgian. The German army was able to get the territory, but they couldn't buy back the lost time. Every army was left stunned by the casualty count just a few weeks into the war, and their plans became worthless. But without those plans, what were they supposed to do? These generals had all grown during the 1800s. They fell back on the old world thinking. Millions would die ordered in grand attack campaigns. And even when these attacks succeeded, the troops often lacked the capability to follow through with the next phase of the plan. Grand sweeping maneuvers like the Nivelle Offensive along the Chemin des Dames proved to be completely worthless, killing men and crippling armies. The battlefield proved the old Robert Burns saw. The best laid plans of mice and men oft go awry. Thanks for listening.